Uh, I would like to thank my co-author, um, Mr. Robert Palomar, as well as those who helped us in the study, uh, Ms. Rixi Madawin, Ms. Um, Lucy Melendez, and uh, Ms. Angel Castillo. So this afternoon, I'll be sharing with you the results of our analysis of the 2022 president's budget. And the focus of this particular study actually is, is highlighted in this particular slide. There will be major shifts in Philippine governance come 2022. There will be a new president administration. There will also be new national and local officials. At the same time, since 2019, um, the national government and local governments have been preparing for the implementation of the Mandanas Garcia Supreme Court ruling, which um, ultimately broadens the base on which the intergovernmental fiscal transfers, formerly known as internal revenue allotments, now to be known as national tax allotments, is computed, which will result in increased resources available for local governments, which, however, were also decided that there would be devolution transitions in the sense of increased responsibilities as well of already devolved functions in the local government code. So we'll be discussing that in more detail later on. But apart from that, also the Philippines will still be having to manage the now endemic COVID-19 and recovering from the economic contraction of 9.5% in 2020. Now, the policy question and objectives of this analysis is very simple. On the outset, I want to make it clear that we will be examining the president's proposed 2022 budget or the National Expenditure Program. And we will see how this will address the priority needs in managing COVID-19 and pump priming the economy. So the objectives in particular would be to examine the NEP distribution versus the identified priorities of the um, uh, president. Now, with the implementation of the Mandana Supreme Court ruling, we will also look at budgetary allot adjustments and allocations of national government programs that offer support to local governments and see the overall impact when it comes to, to the national budget. Now, the priorities of the president's 2022 budget are articulated in the national budget call, which is typically issued December of the preceding fiscal year or early in the year of the fiscal year, the draft, the budget is supposed to be uh, of, uh, or January of the year prior to the budget um, fiscal year. So the national budget call of 2022 identified spending priorities or priority administrative policies in designing the budget to include the zero to 10 point socioeconomic agenda and the Philippine Development Plan, the updated 2017 to 2022 public investment program, and the approved 2022 to 2024 three year, three year rolling infrastructure program. So here would be some of the build, build, build projects. Now, there was also articulated in the NBC the strength in vertical and horizontal linkages through aligned national and regional development plans, prioritizing the needs of the poorest disadvantaged, but while performing LGUs in their sectors. Now, still on the priorities of the President's 2022 budget, as articulated in the national budget call, this is in line with the Mandana's ruling. So, um, national governments should refrain from including proposals funding devolved local projects for the first to fourth income class LGUs. They should limit subsidies for local projects to LGUs to the fifth and sixth income classes. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, the Philippines categorizes or classifies our local governments according to their income. First would be the richest and sixth would be the poorest. So the directive in the national budget call would be to prioritize spending for the fifth and sixth income class municipalities or those that are uh, LGUs, or those that have geographically isolated and depressed areas, or GDAS. Or in addition, those with the highest poverty incidence ranked up, ranked in top third highest. Now, apart from this, NGA should also include funding requirements for capacity building for these LGUs to enable them to, to be able to spend the increased revenues that, uh, yeah, the increased resources that they will be receiving as well as the assumed functions that they will be also absorbing. And um, this is actually also very crucial um, because one of our previous studies at the uh, PIDS found that um, the development planning processes of municipalities needs to be improved. Now, the overarching theme of the NEP is sustaining the legacy of real change for future generations. And there are two aspects that we will focus on in our particular analysis of the president's budget. 
First, uh, it prioritizes funding for COVID-19 response measures, including healthcare development and social services. And second, it also plans to sustain public sector investments, primarily through infrastructure spending, to restore it to the pre-pandemic growth trajectory. <clears throat> Now, what is the framework and methodology? First of all, it's important to understand that the national budget is a common resource. And according to public sector theory, typically being a limited resource, there's a negative externality imposed by those that get a larger share, since this would reduce the share of other agencies and sectors if we're talking about the national budget. So therefore, the approach of this study will be to examine the 2022 net according to the declared budgetary priorities and its distribution across the sectors and subsectors, which I'll be sharing later on. And relative to its historical budgetary priorities, we have data, uh, secondary data from DBM, BSP, and PSA, which date back to 1983. So this is what we will be using to analyze and compare the, the trends in uh, the, the, the changes in the current budget, the purpose, proposed budget for 2022. Now, it's also important to take a step back and, you know, situate what the importance of understanding this, this objective is. And I'd like to just briefly talk about, you know, macroeconomic theory and policy on economic growth and aggregate demand. Now, for economic growth theory, it was trying to explain why some economies are richer than others and why some continuously grow compared to others. And there are two, there are two, um, general schools of thought. The first would be the neoclassical growth theory, which suggests that the way an economy grows would be through investment in physical capital, and this would be infrastructure. But then a shortcoming of this neoclassical growth theory is that it explained economic growth only up until a certain point. And this is where endogenous growth theory came in. It redefined capital to include not just physical capital and infrastructure, but also highlight the importance of investing in human capital particularly knowledge and research and development to continuously make um, people more productive and contributing more to the economy. And that's the importance of both investments in human capital and in physical capital, such as infrastructure. But that's the long, long run theory. The short run theory of aggregate demand by Man Q 2019 showed here would give you the national income accounting identity here, which shows that the national income or the national output or GDP as we know it, is comprised of consumption spending, which is a function of taxes, investment spending, which is a function of interest rates, and government spending, which is basically the budget that we are describing, we're going to be analyzing today, as well as net exports, which is a function of the real exchange rate. And here it's clear to see the policy lever tools available to the public sector, which would be through government spending or taxes, and through maintaining interest rates. And this would all affect the different variables such as consumption goods, investment goods and services, as well as government purchases. And I'd just like to, in the interest of time, just highlight the government purchase here is defined as goods and services bought by national and local governments, including transfer payments to individuals such as social security and welfare benefits, though these are not part of GDP, since these are simply redistributing existing income. But military equipment, highways, basic health and education services. It's as if the national government through the budget is behaving as a consumer and purchasing goods and services in the economy, which would hopefully lead to the multipliers, the fiscal multipliers that we hear. So if, for example, like at PIDS, our services or my services before at UP as a teacher, I got paid for my services by the government and I use that income and spend it in the economy. And this is how multipliers happen. So my what I spend in the economy would be the income of those receiving it, and they also would spend in turn. So this is the hope um, of how GDP could also be um, could also pick up through the fiscal multipliers. Now, let's take a look at the expenditure distribution by expense class. So there are three expense classes. There's capital outlay, there's current operating expenditures, and there's net lending. In the 2022 NEP, or the President's budget, um, the majority or 74.2% of it will go to current operating expenditures, which comprises of personal services and maintenance and other operating expenditures. 25.2% of it will go to capital outlays, and the rest would go to, to net lending. Now, for the past 40 years, if you look at the right side of this particular slide, um, Capit uh, current operating expenditures has received the largest share, averaging about 79%.
Now let's take a look in more detail at infrastructure and other capital outlay expenditures. So this is as a percent of GDP, 1983 to 2022 figures. So infrastructure and other capital outlay peaked in 2017. So capital outlay is the 25.2% I mentioned earlier. It is the highest most uh, graph here, um, uh, line here. Um, below it would be infrastructure and other capital outlay, which peaked in 2017 to be 6.5%. And it dipped, um, of course, because of uh, the pandemic. And it's recovering, hopefully, to recover at 5.9% in the proposed 20, 2022 budget. Now, in the past decade, this has averaged about 4.4% of GDP compared to the previous decade um, where it averaged only about 1.8% of GDP. So I think that moving forward, we should still try to maintain um, this, uh, this, uh, this goal of uh, higher spending of GDP on uh, infrastructure and capital outlay. Now, let's take a look at the uh, Philippine expenditure distribution by sector. So we have the major sectors here. We have general public services, social services, economic services. We have defense, debt servicing, and net lending. So I'm just reporting this um, for completion, but really the productive services of the, uh, the productive sectors would exclude debt servicing, and that's what's used to compute the primary balance. But here we see social services is poised to get a 3% increase from 2021, and the largest share of the budget at 38.3%. This is 38.3% of the 5.024 trillion proposed president's budget. Okay. Now the second would be economic services, although its share is dipping slightly um, to 29.3%. Um, and we'll see later on that the reason why is because um, gov uh, the president's budget shows priority more for the social services as well as the general public services. Um, not just because of trying to address social protection, but also because of the increase in the subsidies to LGUs. So we'll see it in the later slides. But in any case, you could see the trend here. Ever since 1995, this, this dark brown um, trend line here shows that social services has always received the largest um, share of the budget. Now let's take a, take a look at the subsector distribution. So this is the social service distribution from 1983 to 2022. As you can see here, education, culture, manpower development has consistently received the largest share, though this has been decreasing through time. So this is the share of education, culture, and manpower development. It has been decreasing through time, but it's still the largest. And education sector has consistently been receiving the largest, as is mandated by the Constitution. Okay. Now, in 2022, the dip in its share of, uh, from 46.7% to 48.1% is to accommodate the increased allocations to social security and labor welfare subsector and to the subsidy to local government units to 19.8%. So here you see um, the broken line here below is what um, represents the social security and labor welfare. So it's it's picking up and this is because largely we'll see later that there was a huge increase in the allocation for four piece, the four piece program for social protection. Um, at the same time, you can see uh, the subsidy to LGUs is the solid line here, um, just below, and it's also picking up uh, just below the share of uh, social security and labor welfare. Now, health will also receive a 14.1% increase in its budget. Now, for economic services distribution, we can see here that communication, roads, and transportation have consistently received the largest share of economic services. Well, this is post-1990, or perhaps after 1994 or 93. So, so here, this is communication on top. Now, there are proposed budgetary or nominal budgetary increases for the agri, agrarian reform, and natural resource, um, trade and industry subsectors, as well as tourism and communication and roads and transportation. So these are the subsectors. They will receive nominal increases, though their shares will um, be sort of con contracting just to give way to the increase in um, the subsidy to LGUs, as you can see here. So this is the subsidy to LGUs. So it's sort of, you know, squeezing out a bit uh, in terms of shares. Now, in terms of the top 10 national government departments or agencies uh, with regards to the proposed budget, here let me um, mention that we look first at the individual departments and agencies in and rank them in terms of their budgetary allocation. 
Okay, so if it's just the individual department budgets that we're looking at, DPWH gets the highest, uh, the largest amount, um, DepEd follows, and then does DILG. Okay, so this is just for the individual department budgets. But if you look to the proposed consolidated budget, let's say for education, as is mandated in the constitution that the largest share of the budget should go to education purposes. If you see the summary of the president's budget, man, uh, budget message, the DepEd, SOOCs, and TESDA and SHED would receive the largest. So they would rank number one if you, if you want to aggregate it by that amount. So totaling about 77, 773 billion for, for, all, for these four agencies. Okay. Now on managing and uh, the COVID pandemic, both for health and for social protection expenditures too, to help assist those who, the poor and vulnerable who were affected both physically and economically by the, the pandemic. Now, one of the main three pillars of the 2022 national budget, uh, proposed national budget is building resilience amidst the pandemic. So the DH has a total proposed budget of 157.5, which represents a 16% increase. As you can see, it's been on the uptrend. Now, major programs related to the COVID response include allocation of drugs, medicines, and vaccines, health facilities enhancement programs, and the prevention on control of communicable diseases. Okay, but other COVID-specific programs include COVID laboratory network commodities, as well as human resources for emergency hiring. Now, for social protection expenditures, a health and social protection expenditures, still on health, no? So let's take a look at the PhilHealth. The budgetary support for PhilHealth spikes in 2022 to 79.9 billion. And this would be for the contributions of indigents, senior citizens, persons with disabilities, and financially incapable at point of service um, individuals, as well as Pamana beneficiaries of 61 million. So these are the ones affected by in conflict afflicted areas. Okay. Now for social protection, which is another aspect of the NEPS COVID-19 management. Here we present the, the, the proposed budgets for social welfare programs. So there are social welfare programs which go beyond um, DSWD. So there's also one school-based feeding program under the Department of Education, and it's included in this. And the PIDS also has a recently published for this year, a research paper series, also a, a public expenditure review of social protection in the Philippines. So here we can see the forerunner on top is actually the four-piece program. So in the 191.2 billion allotted for the DSWD, the largest share is allocated to four piece. So um, this shows uh, what I mentioned earlier, explaining that um, the social welfare and labor, uh, social sec sector and labor welfare um, subsector of social services actually squeezed out some of the, the other subsectors in social services to accommodate for these increases in um, social protection programs. Now on to the implementation of the Mandanas ruling. So this graph shows you the uh, Assistance to Local Government Units um, Special Purpose Fund. So it's called ALGU. And it has historically received an average of 0.018% of the budget per year since 2008. Now the 2022 budget uh, for ALGU overall has an additional 271.77 billion, which is equal to about 0.02% of the total budget. Now part and parcel of this, the largest part of it would be the intergovernmental fiscal transfer, which is called the internal revenue allotment. Okay, oh, it's now to be known the national tax allotment or the NATA. Okay, so for this year, uh, the NATA will settle at 959 billion, which is about 20% of the 5.024 trillion budget proposed, and which is about 4% of GDP. Um, there was a 38% increase of about 263.5 billion from the 2021 era. And this is because of the what I mentioned earlier, the broadened base on which to compute the intergovernmental fiscal transfers. Now, before I go to the next slide, just a bit of a brief history. One of the, one of the options envisioned um, in earlier years up leading, leading up to this implementation of the Mandana Supreme Court ruling was actually um, deciding how to allow for um, increased transfers to local governments, but without, you know, decreasing fiscal space. So the idea before, one of the suggestions was to reduce the amount of um, national government, local government unit assistance programs um, in order to be able to accommodate increases. Now, if you recall also earlier, the national budget call I mentioned had a directive to refrain from proposing programs for richer LGUs. 
However, when we examined the, the budget, we found that there are still some general LGU assistance programs present. A total of about 57 billion of the 119.86 billion proposed um, national government LGU assistance programs. Um, this is not to say that all of this um, it goes against that, but um, for example, the DA, it's explicit in their special provisions that this amount uh, for the small scale irrigation and farm to market road should go to the poorer municipal, uh, poor, poorer LGUs. And the same thing for the, the, I will be discussing the growth equity fund later. It goes to the LGUs. But, but for the DPWH programs, at least the basic infrastructure programs, it's still silent. It's still for the general LGUs. Um, and though there was a huge increase, decrease rather, from 117 billion in 2021, it is now proposed by the president's budget to be about 39.6 billion in 2022. Though I saw the House version of the third reading, this goes up by 27% to be about 50 billion. Now, another innovation uh, in the 2022 budget with regards to the Mandana's ruling would be the Growth Equity Fund, which is envisioned to be this, the fiscal equalization fund and which will serve as the main NG support to the extremely poor and disadvantaged LGUs. So this is proposed to address issues on marginalization, unequal development, high poverty incidents and disparities in the net fiscal capacities of LGUs. Okay, so the president's budget proposed this to be about 10 billion to cover the funding requirements of programs, projects and activities of poor, disadvantaged and lagging LGUs to gradually enable the full and efficient implementation of the functions and services de uh, devolved to them. But if I, the, when I checked the house version again, it was, this was decreased to 4 billion of the growth equity fund. Now, um, the growth equity fund also is proposed to be time bound and performance based and shall be provided to the LGUs for a fixed time frame. Now, one other innovation in the proposed budget that was introduced last year, but which I also would like to highlight here because moving forward, this is also the direction we need to go. Um, institutional innovations, particularly streamlining and digitalization in government. So the COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, forced us to find different ways to provide um, goods and services at the government level, especially in terms of, let's say, providing social protection assistance such as the SAP, the Social Amelioration Program, there were some that engaged with um, financial service providers to be able to make it easier to deliver the assistance to, to those who need it at the soonest possible time. And there was this um, introduction in, in last year's budget called the Medium Term Information and Communications Technology Harmonization Initiative, or the METI Initiative, which I'd like to highlight here. So the majority goes to the DICT OSEC, okay, for, uh, you know, an investment in ICT infrastructure, but also a part of it goes to the FILSIS, the PSA, 4.8 billion of it for the FILSIS, the national ID, because one of the initial delays, uh, reason for the delays in the distribution of the first tranche of the SAP before was because there was a lack of integrated information systems on those who were poor and vulnerable. So, so hopefully, you know, fast tracking the FILSIS will help address this. Um, now, 574 million of this is addressed also, is um, allocated for community-based statistics, especially for the poorer municipalities, the fifth and sixth class municipalities. Um, and also it's explicit in the budget that the, uh, they propose that there is a need for digital technology in the pursuit of swift, swift administration of justice. So this is just an aspect of the budget that should also be highlighted and it should also be continued by the next administration. Now, let me go on to the general findings. Um, the president's budget overall social services gets the largest share of the proposed budget with education receiving the largest proportion. However, the decline in its 2021 share is to accommodate social security and labor welfare and subsidy to LGUs consistent with the um, national budget call. Economic services shares dip slightly from 2021 with only the share of subsidy to LGUs increasing by 15.9%. So we can see that, you know, um, the share of subsidies to LGUs sort of crowds out the other subsectors in the economic services. Now, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic management, uh, we saw that DOH and PhilHealth both received increased budgetary allocations. And uh, for social protection, the spikes in the proposed uh, budget of social assistance program went primarily to, is, well, will go primarily to 40s if it's passed. Okay, this is also consistent with the national budget call. Now, for the Mandana's ruling, 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, the national tax allotment increased to 200 uh, by 38 percent to settle at uh, 959 billion uh, in the budget. Now, what budgetary adjustments happened? Well, major assistance programs are still present, although some are redefined to be exclusively for the fifth, the poorer municipalities. Um, but it decreased, the total amount decreased only by 18% compared to last year's budget, owing largely to the reduction of the DPWH's uh, basic infrastructure program. The growth equity fund replaced LGSFAM for provinces, cities, and municipalities, and is, is envisioned to, to provide assistance only to the poorer or more disadvantaged um, uh, local governments. Now, these programs must be closely monitored along with um, and must also be implemented along with capacity building programs. Now, with respect to the institutional shifts, METHI is a convergence program, uh, and we have to take advantage of digitalization in the, the delivery of public goods and services. And there was also priority spending on the national ID and the implementation of the CBMS for the poor LGUs. These are needed for more efficient delivery of social assistance and, uh, and to improve targeting as well. Now, what are the recommendations? Closely monitor and calibrate the extent and need for social protection and other investments in human capital. As the economy opens up with increased vaccination rates, the hope is unemployment and underemployment rates should decline. So these should be closely monitored. For local governments, the GEF, or Growth Equity Fund Implementation, along with other national government, local government assistance programs, should be closely monitored to ensure that only the targeted LGUs benefit from these technical capacity development programs in or to effectively use the additional resources and allow them to contribute to national development as well as are needed. Now, there should be continued investments in information, ICT infrastructure to facilitate its utilization across the different sectors, especially since these would make the delivery of public services quicker and also in the case of education, help health reduce the scarring effect. Now, the challenge of the next administration would be fiscal consolidation, tapering of the debt to GDP ratio without sacrificing much needed human and infrastructure capital investments. These should be combined with job creation for economic recovery. Therefore, there is need for prudent fiscal stimulus in the medium term to be able to accelerate economic growth. So that's all. Thank you very much.